Good evening and welcome to Celeb Chat. My guest today is Ruth Freeman, a citizen of both Sri Lanka and America, and currently well known for her novel, D A Disobedient Girl, which she is not. Good evening, Rooney. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you. Same here. Let's start about the book. Michelle de Cresta says, A Disobedient Girl is a deeply affecting novel by a compassionate and observant writer. How compassionate are you and how observant are you as a writer? Well, I think all writers are observant. And uh, I mean, most of the time, I think writers, and certainly I am very rarely with, totally present in a conversation because all the time you're observing what's going on and you're thinking and you're taking these Hi, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know you're there, <laughs> but, uh, but, but a part of me is observing what's going on. I mean, I, I went out to dinner with uh, a whole bunch of friends from uh, Holy Family because I went to Holy Family first and then to ladies. And uh, it was lovely and we were talking and I was listening to everything, but part of me was actually out of, you. Out of me thinking about the different threads that I could use in stories and Lovely. things like that. So, um, so I think I, I mean I don't think that's unique to me. I think all writers work that way. They are constantly taking a few notes. If you get a bunch of writers together, often uh, if someone is beginning to tell an interesting story, they'll look around and then they'll stop because they don't they know <laughs> that the other writers are okay. going to take that story. So, right, okay. so they don't say it. Yeah. Um, as for compassionate, I mean I grew up with. Uh, in a family that was very compassionate. So, uh, I mean, really? our family was always, um, a ho it was a home that was open to many people all the time. There was always people staying in our houses and, um, and um, uh, anybody who needed help, my parents always helped them. And there was never a question of whether you could or couldn't and this is what you did. And uh, so I think my brothers and I all, both grew, all three of us grew up um, to look at the world that way and to reach out to people in that way. And, uh, and so some element of that is there, I think. How did the story happen, A Disobedient Girl? Um, it started, I mean, I started writing the story at uh, Breadloaf, which is a writer's conference in the United States. It's, uh, it's its oldest writer's conference. It's a wonderful place. And uh, we had been given a, a, a writing assignment just to write about anything. And uh, and I'm always very happy when I'm there. I'm just deliriously happy. And so I wanted to write deliriously something. Deliriously happy. Okay. I am. I am. Nice. I'm just. I'm Sounds just, nice. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's lovely. And uh, and I wanted to. Okay, write what is it there that makes you so happy? Because I'm surrounded by writers, and it's a place where I get to be only me, um, not the mother, not the wife, not the daughter, not anybody, but just oh. me, the writer. And uh, and everything that I want to do and be, I can. I can. And I can just put out there. And You're let loose. Basically. I'm let loose, yeah, and I'm free in a way. I think that um, that I don't necessarily feel in the other places where I find myself. So, uh, and and then on top of that, you're surrounded by these writers, and every conversation is something interesting about mm -hmm. writing and uh, the way of that way of looking at the world, and uh, so that's very heady. Um, so, so I think, in, in, and I've actually said that before, is that I think Breadloaf is a place where I feel most at home in the United States because it's a place that just takes me as just who I am. Um, anyway, so, so we had been given this writing prompt and uh, uh, to write anything. And because I'm so deliciously happy there, I wanted to write something that was deeply dark and depressing and sad. Okay. And so I started writing Bissos that first paragraph yeah. in Bezos chapter and uh, um, and then I and then I started going with that story uh, subsequently you know, after I had left the conference um, but when I came to the end of that chapter I started a new chapter and it had Lata in it and she was a very different person um, so I decided that I realized I had these two characters and I needed two stories but they had to somehow come together yeah so so that's how that story got started but Lata, who is a servant in the book, and um, is some is somebody who th that character is someone I drew from uh, a girl who used to work. She's real. 
Well, oh. she's no, the, just just fragments. You know, she that name and um, her sort of her personality, her feisty personality, is something that I got from a from a real Lata who was the daughter of someone who worked for my grandmother actually in Purunagala at my mother's house. And because uh, she had always intrigued me, she was a lot like me. She was, uh, you know, we were the same size, very androgynous, boyish, short hair, and that kind of tomboyish girls. And uh, she, I just. Are you still that? Are you still yeah. that? Am I still that? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> 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 what do you think? <laughs> Later. Yeah. So, um, so, but. Uh, I had always been interested in her, so when when I when that character came, you know, I kind of had her on my mind. Mm -hmm. But the whole uh, business of servants is something that I had written about all my life. I, I was looking back at essays I had written in at HFC and places. I realized that every essay that I had to write, somehow there was a servant involved in it. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, so it was, I think, one of the stories that I had to write and and tell. So so I did. Um, but that interest in people who I see as the bystanders in life, you know, janitors and uh, wait staff and security guards and people who are often not uh, seen by people, but who actually see a lot uh, and so observe a lot. Yes, they do. Yeah, so th those people have always intrigued me. And uh, I mean, I dedicated my um, undergraduate honors thesis to the lady who used to clean the dorms. And I've just been always interested in them. So, okay. uh, so I think that's... Uh, that's where that comes from. How do you, okay, how does one structure a novel like this? Um, you come with no preconceived notions, obviously. Well, I mean, I think there are, I have, um, I know writers who plan everything out, so they have a story and they have, they have a structure, they, have a structure, they know what they're going to do and, and, and it works for them. Yes, and okay. they fill in, they say, okay, this is going to happen in the middle of the book yeah. and so then what needs to happen before then so and that works for me it's more a case of um, telling myself the story so if I know the whole story it becomes very boring and uh, so in some way I beg your pardon no if yeah. you know the story it becomes boring okay yeah like if I know well, you should know it well you're writing it I know but I don't know it uh, I don't know the whole story I only know just okay. a little bit it's like you know when people accompany singers on a piano the piano is always a little bit behind, and yeah, so half a tone, a tone yeah, behind. Sometimes. Yeah, so it's kind of like that. I'm always a little bit behind the story, for me, and that's what works for me. And there are other writers for whom that works as well. Um, so, but because because if you know the whole story, then there's what's the point in writing it? And so yeah. as you follow it, it's exciting and interesting, and you you wonder, you know, what are they going to do? Okay, so now she finds herself in this house, and what does she do in that house? And then you then you write that part and. Um, and so you keep on going like that, and then that's what works. So for you me. kind of unravel this thing as you go on. As you go on, yeah, and then you you get to the end, and you have some vague ideas. I mean, it's not like you have nothing, but you have some. What about the ending? Do you know what the end is like, or do you work around it, work towards it? I work towards it, and then and then I have an idea. I I know that you know some in this particular case something very tragic happens, and um, so then it's a case of how how does she. How does that happen? You know, how do you how do you get there? And then how does the tragedy unfold? Also, I mean, I know it's a tragedy, but I don't know exactly how. What kind of tragedy is she going to? Uh, you know, y there's so many things you could do. You could put a bullet in your head, mm. or you could do anything. So, um, so that's what I do. So, from the first draft to the final novel, how much of editing do you do <coughs> yourself? Um, uh, the cutting, the chopping, the adding, the rewriting, the rephrasing. I've got better at it. I mean, when I first, uh, the first book I wrote, which I always call the bad book, uh, it's uh, <laughs> be it's harsh on No, it's not this one that was published. There's okay. another one before that, and I it was a learning experience because I had this e enormous tome of about 487 pages, and I thought it was brilliant, and not not one word could be taken out because it was so brilliant in my mind, and uh, it's only afterwards, you know. In fact, I had given it to my brother to read, and uh, one of my brothers, and uh, Malinda, and he read, I think, about 10 pages, and he said, uh, you know, this is a really a bit of a useless book because we know everything that's going to happen. We know all the good people. We know all the bad people. There's nothing to think about. And I just coughed at him, like, oh, you're just a journalist. What, what would you know about writing? Oh, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I took my 487 pages and carted it around for a while, and then I, 
then I realized that uh, you know he's right. It it really was that not a very good book, and uh, partly because I couldn't take anything out and I couldn't really leave anything up to the reader. It was just very overwhelmingly me in the book, and uh, so I learned how to do that. And I'm not that a jazz. I I'm I'm more conscious of what makes a readable novel rather than what I want to say. So so I could take something and say, okay, this doesn't really. You've sharpened uh, the skill along yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, along the way. Interesting, we're going to our first break and back at the show with our guest tonight, Rue Freeman. Back to my guest, Rue Freeman. Rue, you were a featured guest at the Goyle Literary Festival, which is a much loved, much maligned event in Sri Lanka. What was your experience like? Um, I got to stay at the Lighthouse Hotel, which number I had one. wanted. <laughs> no, I mean, not number one, but that was a very big, uh, that was very exciting for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Um, most writers are pretty uh, impoverished people who cannot stay in such places, and so it was a very nice experience to be there. But um, it was soon after my mother's death, and so that was the first time I was coming back. I was also coming back for her three-month dhani, and so uh, so it was kind of a mixed uh, feeling for me to be there. Um, but I'd heard so much about it, and it was very lovely to be invited. And um, you know, it was not something that existed when I was a kid no. in Sri Lanka, and so th so there are positives. You know, that the fact that it exists at all, and then because it exists, we get to talk about how it could be better, and it has grown in different ways over the years. Um, I think, I mean, Jaipur, uh, I guess that's the one, I mean, I, I'm thinking about the different festivals that I'm familiar with. There's the Frankfurt Book Fair, and the London Book Fair, and the, um, all of these, those are very big, you know, festivals that uh, cater to making book deals and things. And then you have um, the Berlin Book Festival, which is completely literary from nine to midnight, it goes on, um, which are you know very different to Gaul. And then I guess the closest thing to us would be Jaipur, um, which I think it began I think in 2006 with 18 writers and 100 attendees, and now in 2011 it had 226 writers and 30,000 uh, people attending. And um, you know obviously. <coughs> the Gaul Festival can't do the same thing in terms of, I mean, space, physical space, physical space cons you know, uh, is a bit constricting. Mm, so, you know, uh, but also I think that uh, f in having gone to many festivals, I know that writers go back and they talk about the festivals that they like a lot. And the way I think you get people to do that is when they feel that the festival itself is very invested and takes literature very seriously. Um, for my one of my favorite festivals in the United States, which is you know my easiest comparison, is uh, the Penn World Writers Festival, which is in New York City, and they go out of their way to bring uh, a real breadth of high quality literary uh, voices and make them accessible to everybody. So even writers who are established or up and coming writers or writers like me, we would volunteer so that we can we get to listen to these people and we get to be among them. So what did you find interesting about the Gaul Literature Festival in GLF? Stimulating, interesting. I enjoyed meeting uh, some of the South Asian writers, in particular Rana Das Gupta, whom I uh, was wonderful. Uh, I met uh, Shehan, you know, who wrote uh, China Man there. Um, I was able to talk, I was able to listen to one of the first, it was an off-site panel about, uh, it was a little early t to talk about it, but it was still interesting, the post-conflict. Uh, Literature, um, you know, post-conflict in Sri Lanka literature. That you know that wasn't time. that too premature. A wee bit too premature. Um, no, because I think I mean we are in a post-conflict uh, period in terms of armed battle. So and that had ended, and so this was this was uh, uh, this was that um, panel. So I got to listen to that, um, and all of those things were very interesting. And it was interesting to see how the festival was run. It's something I'd heard about and I'd never been to. Um, I mean, 